this, these are very short talks. I want to give you a, a brief um, picture of some of the work that we're doing in what we call the causal analysis of the attention system. And I'll explain what that means in just a moment. Um, we study um, the, uh, control, the top-down control of visual processing in the visual system of primates, both monkeys and people. Uh, you know, and, and, and of course this is based on the processing in the ventral stream that goes from the vis primary visual cortex in the temporal lobe, where there's this elaboration of, of visual features. And, and along with this uh, progressive elaboration of visual features, there's a progressive increase in receptive field size. Um, and um, as, um, as, as uh, we have described in, in papers with Tommy Poggio, uh, this is, uh, results in increasing clutter within these receptive fields, which causes a, a computational problem, how you do object recognition in, in, in the midst of all this clutter. And, um, and one of the things that we've argued over the years is that um, the, the primary uh, role of attention in the system is to reduce the influence of clutter on the cells. Uh, to make um, the, compu the computations underlying object recognition more efficient. And uh, we've primarily worked in um, the realm of spatially directed attention, uh, which we, uh, lots of evidence suggests is based on uh, feedback from uh, structures that include at least the frontal eye fields in, um, sorry, in prefrontal cortex. Uh, and um, we've shown that um, uh, that uh, we, we just recently completed a series of studies on the pulvinar, which we think is actually not the, the controller of attention in the cortex, uh, but uh, probably, uh, probably circuits in parietal cortex share a lot of the spatial functions with the frontal eye fields. And um, in these studies, what we've, uh, since uh, the studies have shown that, that almost processing throughout almost the whole system is being modulated by behavioral relevance, attention, and so on, uh, if you want to understand the, 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 me the mechanics of how it works, you really need to know, understand more about what causes what, not just to know that everything is being modulated by relevance. Uh, where's the source of these signals, how they work, and so on. And so we've been trying to bring a number of tools to bear on this question of causality. What gets these processes started? Uh, and then how do they affect their targets? And uh, some of those tools involve just um, analysis of the precise timing of signals across structures. Um, imagine if you have, in, in this toy example, uh, areas A and B that are reciprocally connected. And we know that a lot of these circuits are, have resonant properties, so they go into at least some degree of coherent oscillations um, when, um, when the neurons are firing. And if you set up a toy network, for example, these two populations of cells, A and B, with the appropriate time delays between them, with, but with A causing uh, the firing of cells in B, but then there's a reciprocal inter, um, effect of B on A, with a 10 millisecond delay, uh, that you, would, you, could, you can see evidence for coherent interactions between the two groups, and you'll have a phase shift in the coherence that is um, reflecting this 10 millisecond uh, temporal delay. And if you just look at the latency of action in one circuit versus another, likewise, you would see that the latency of, um, of changes in activity in A precede those in B. There are shorter latencies in B, and you can use another uh, tool that we and others often use is Granger causality, looking at the statistical influence of signals in A on B and vice versa and so on. Uh, all of these methods, temporal methods, have problems of interpretation, uh, and so that's why we like to see convergence across all the different um, analysis um, methods. Uh, of course, one of what, what many people regard as sort of the gold standard of testing causality is to actually perturb activity in one structure. Uh, so you could either uh, deactivate the cells in one structure or activate the cells in one structure and then see their effect on another structure. And I'll be talking about uh, many of these different uh, tools um, in this brief talk today. Now, uh, as I said, most of the work that we've been doing has been on uh, spatially directed attention, but in recent years, um, we've developed a major interest in feature object-based attention. And to give you um, an example of how you use this all the time, if I ask you to find the girl in the pink shirt in this scene, you can all do that, I'm sure, very quickly. Uh, and um, 
and far fewer eye movements than there are objects in the scene. But if you think about it, it's, it's this is really a mysterious process. If you compare it to spatial attention, if I tell you to pay attention to the upper left-hand corner of the visual field, well, that's not so mysterious to understand. We have lots of spatial maps in our brain. You can imagine higher activity in one portion of one map. But, but where's, the, where's the map of girls in pink shirts? And so how does that come about? Uh, and it's not some simple spatial thing. It's, um, there's got to be some stored representation of what these things even mean uh, and, and to, be, to be able to use them to guide our search. And we think the problem is, is very similar to some of the problems in memory recall. If I ask you, for example, to uh, imagine what your mother looks like, I'm sure most of you can do that. Uh, and we know from brain imaging studies that, that this involves activation in um, lots of early visual areas that are presumably uh, holding the visual representation of your mother's image. Um, but, but where do those signals come from and how, how do they impact processing back in visual areas that, that could uh, create this kind of image? So one of the ways that we've um, tried to identify the sources of these signals and how they work in, in uh, across the whole brain in human subjects is using magnetoencephalography, uh, which of course gives us a very accurate timing of neural signals. Again, so we can look at this, do this sort of causal analysis using timing. Um, and the, um, as you'll hear in a moment, we combine this with fMRI to get the increased spatial localization. And whereas in spatial attention, you can um, just look at the relevant portions of the spatial maps, of course, for feature object-based attention, uh, you, there's no map per se, but instead we will make use of the known uh, specialization for object processing in, in the temporal cortex. And the, uh, the examples that we're going to, the, the object processing modules that we're going to make use of are the fusiform face area and the parahippocampal place area. It was originally shown by Nancy Kamwisher and her colleagues. Um, the, uh, the fusiform face area is preferentially activated by images of the faces. Parahippocampal area preferentially activated by images of scenes, including houses. Uh, in fact, and, and Nancy has used uh, this uh, difference in object feature selectivity uh, in previous fMRI studies uh, showing how attention can modulate processing across these different um, object modules. Uh, now for Meg, uh, of course, there's, we have to make, we, ha we have to operate within the constraints of the technique. Um, and one of the things that we need to do is to be able to identify uh, which signals are coming from the processing of objects versus the processing of scenes, in this case, houses. Sorry, did I say the faces versus houses? Uh, and so we make use of a technique that, that other people have used known as uh, the steady state evoke potential or some, something called frequency tagging in which we present the stimuli in a temporal stream of um, faces and houses and the subjects are doing a one back memory task and are cued for whether they should attend to the face or the house on a given trial. Uh, and then we, because they're in a temporal stream, we can uh, use slightly different frequencies for the two stimuli, in this case one and a half hertz and two hertz and then we can just look into the, to the brain signals and find the one and a half hertz signal and the two hertz signal that pull out the, the signals from the two different uh, object types. Uh, and the, the stimuli are going in and out of phase coherence so there's no sharp uh, temporal transition which we think is, is very important in being able to tease apart the, um, the temporal processing. So to give you an example of what that looks like, this shows you what, what this would look like from the subject's point of view. Uh, and if you're imagining, if you were looking for repetitions of, of faces in the sequence, um, you could do that easily. In fact, subjects do this at a very high level of accuracy for both faces and, and houses. Okay, so that's, that's from the, um, that's the stimulus display. As I said, we've combined the, the, the MEG experiment with um, fMRI in the same subjects to get the better spatial localization. Uh, we have them doing this task and we identify both the face area and the place area uh, and, um, and because, but because they're doing this uh, uh, object attention task we could also uh, do uh, contrast on the task itself and when we do that um, the, the area with the strongest signal is an area in prefrontal cortex that's in humans known as the inferior frontal junction 
Uh, and so we use that as a region of interest in our analysis as well. Now, uh, now we go to the MEG and we use these, the ROIs from the fMRI to, um, to um, localize the signals in, from different locations and then we can look at just, initially we just look at the sensory processing in different regions uh, and this is, shows a lot of data from a lot of structures. I'm just going to go through a, a couple of these. Uh, this shows, this is the frequency spectrum on power uh, for the one and a half and two hertz signals. You can see there's nice peaks at one and a half and two hertz. Um, and um, the blue lines are, represent the signals we get when the subjects are attending to faces and the red lines when the subject are attending to houses. These are always the same physical stimuli in both cases. The only thing that differs here is what the subjects have been cued to attend to. Uh, and if you look at the fusiform face area and the place area, what you can see is in the face area, the sensory signal is higher when the subjects are attending to faces, and in the place area, it's the reverse. The, the signal is higher when they're attending to, to, to the uh, houses. Um, in the inferior frontal junction, um, you see modulation for both in the same region, uh, but it's very, very strong. There's essentially, when the subject are attending to faces, there's essentially no house signal and, and vice versa. Uh, so it's at least encouraging that there could be some interesting signal there. Um, now, one of the um, nice features of having a, essentially sinusoidal uh, signals coming from these areas is it's very easy to just measure the phase of these signals and you can compare them across areas. These don't give you, strictly speaking, a visual response latency because they're going, this, they're going in and out of phase coherence. We regard it really as like the latency of visibility. Uh, and if you measure that in uh, V1, the primary visual cortex versus the face and place area in the IFJ, what you can see is a nice temporal progression across areas. The earliest latencies are in V1, around 20 milliseconds or so you see activity in the face and place area, and about 20 milliseconds after that you see the, the visibility signal coming up in the IFJ, which is presumably just all the bottom-up visual processing. But now, for us, again, in terms of thinking about how one area might be influencing activity in another, um, we have now look at coherent interactions across these areas. And here what we're plotting is the change in coherence uh, as a function of frequency between the IFJ and the face area when the subjects are attending to faces. So this is change in coherence with attention to faces and for the um, place area, we're now looking at the change of coherence with attention to places. And of course, at the tagging frequency, you can see there's a very strong effect that that's not surprising. But interestingly, up here in the gamma frequency range, um, you, what you see is increased gamma coherence across structures um, when in, in, in one case where the that the subject were attending to faces with the IFJ, and then the other case where the subjects were attending to places with the place area in the IFJ, uh, suggesting that, that um, with the appropriate cueing of attention to the different object types, the IFJ would go into coherent interactions with either the face or the place area. And if you do an analysis of the phase of that coherence across areas uh, for both um, attention to um, faces and places, I'm not going to go through the details of this, but what that phase analysis shows is that the IFJ now leads the face and place area by about 20 milliseconds across frequencies, um, which is, um, we, we think is related to the, to the 20 milliseconds in the other direction. It takes an extra 20 milliseconds to activate the IFJ in the terms of bottom-up sensory signals, but then it's about another 20 milliseconds for the IFJ to lead the activity for the face and place area in terms of the top-down attentional signals. Um, now, we've, this relationship that we've seen between the IFJ for faces and places um, with object processing uh, in terms of developing these coherent interactions with the appropriate phase relationships and so on exactly parallel what we've previously found for spatially directed attention between the frontal eye fields and, um, and cells in area V4 for spatially directed attention. Uh, and so we think they're really sort of parallel systems for space and object features, although it's a question of just how general is the IFJ for other types of non-spatial attentional signals. And 
Daniel Baldoff, who's, who's done all this MEG work, has very recent data showing that when he has subjects cued to attend to either the visual or auditory modality in doing um, these tasks and looks at coherent interactions between the IFJ and um, visual areas um, and um, um, between the IFJ and visual areas or, or auditory areas uh, or locations in space, what he finds is that for um, that f uh, when the subjects are cued for modality, it's the IFJ that goes into coherent interactions with the appropriate sensory area, either visual or auditory. Uh, for spatially directed attention, it's the frontal eye fields and the posterior parietal cortex that goes into coherent interactions with the appropriate uh, sensory areas as well. Again, suggesting that maybe the IFJ is playing a very broad role in feedback of all kinds of information except spatial, where there you really have specialization of the frontal eye fields for that kind of spatially directed feedback. Um, now I want to turn to work in the monkey where we get to um, We've used a different type of causal analysis, and for reasons I'll explain in a moment, um, and which we're actually perturbing, actively perturbing activity. In the human experiments, it's difficult to, act, to actively perturb activity, but we're, but we're in the middle of, of trying to use neurofeedback as a way of uh, controlling activity in human cortex. But in monkeys, we can use pharmacological methods combined with neural recordings to, get, to test these ideas of what causes what. Um, and the task that we use in the monkey is a, is a visual search task in which the monkey has to use object information to find a target in a display of multiple objects. The basic idea is the monkey starts by fixating, it gets a cue, which is in some object to find, and then gets, uh, on search trials, it gets an array of randomly positioned objects, and it, it's free to move its eyes around until it finds the object that matches the cue. So that would be the target matching the, the, um, the object cue. Uh, on comparison detection trials, there's no, no distractors. The monkey just goes directly to the, to the target. Now to um, separate out spatially directed attention from object-based attention in visual search, um, we um, we can look at two different types of trials or epochs in this task. And for spatially directed attention, it's very simple. We can look at activity when the animal is going to make an eye movement into the receptive field of the cell versus the same stimulus, but the animal is making an eye movement someplace else. That's conventional. And, but for feature directed attention, we would look at trials where the monkey is specifically uh, going to make an, an eye movement someplace else. So here might be the receptive field of the cell, the monkey's going to make an eye movement somewhere else, so spatial attention is directed elsewhere. But now we can look at whether um, at the interaction between the stimulus in the receptive field and what the monkey's looking for. So we can look, at, let's say, at the response to the shoe when the monkey's looking for a shoe versus when the monkey's looking for a face, something like that. Um, again, same physical stimulus but different cueing conditions. And when we do that, and we, um, now what we've done is we've recorded in the frontal eye fields of monkeys um, um, along with an area that uh, we believe could be the monkey equivalent of the IFJ, an area that we've begun to call the, the ventral uh, prearcuate region, which is the part of prefrontal cortex just in front of the frontal eye fields. And uh, one thing that um, we we're struck with is that um, if you compare receptive fields and um, the frontal eye fields in VPA, um, uh, that there's a, although there's a mixture of receptive field sizes in VPA, and some cells have very large receptive fields that include the center of gaze, there's also many cells in VPA that have very similar re receptive fields to frontal eye field cells. And if you sort of plot the, um, the fall off in response as a function of distance from the receptive field center, uh, these VPA cells with receptive fields look very similar to frontal eye field cells. So they carry spatial information consistent with what Earl Miller and many other people have reported in prefrontal cortex. Um, the uh, other parts of, of prefrontal cortex uh, have, um, beyond the VPA, have much, much larger receptive fields. And in addition to having this, um, having FEF type receptive fields, they also carry information about the object, which is unlike the frontal eye fields. Frontal eye field cells only care about where the object is. 
uh, or whether it's a target for an eye movement, but they don't care about um, uh, the nature of the object. Whereas if you compare uh, VPA with the anterior inferior temporal cortex, there's actually fairly comparable object selectivity for the VPA cells, just plotting the response and best to worst stimulus. Um, and, and there's somewhat less, but significant object selectivity in other parts of prefrontal cortex. Again, not surprising. Now, so what happens in the visual search task when the monkey is using object information to find a target in a display? And so here we're going to separate out responses according to uh, whether they are modulated by the spatial direction of the animal's attention. And that's looking at the responses here. This is, uh, in this case, uh, for both the frontal eye fields and the uh, and VPA, we're looking at the responses to when the animal is making an eye move into the receptive field versus outside. So that's the spatial signal. And there's a nice spatial signal in each area. Although, we can look at the temporal, the timing uh, of these um, signals, the latency of the signal is earlier in the frontal eye fields than in VPA, about 100 milliseconds versus 138 milliseconds. So the, v F, the frontal eye field seems to have temporal precedence for space. But then if you look at the feature attention component, which is the modulation of response according to whether the object is the thing that the animal is looking for, now what you see is that the signal in the VPA for features are, is, is shorter. The, the cells um, f essentially show this differentiation of response earlier in VPA than in the frontal eye fields. And if you look at a um, cumulative distribution of latencies across cells, uh, again, you see that for feature-based attention, the VPA cells are showing the earliest latencies. But for the, the spatial-based attention, it's the frontal eye field cells that are showing the the earliest latencies, suggesting that perhaps the VPA is the source of information about where the target object is, uh, and but for once, once a decision is made about moving the eyes to one location or the other, the, the frontal eye fields, of course, is, is playing the dominant role in that process. Now, I told you that um, in the monkeys, we can do more active manipulations of activities to test these ideas. Uh, and so we've done deactivation of EPA uh, with Musimol and looked at both the uh, animal's um, perform behavioral performance and the effects on the responses of cells in the frontal eye fields after the um, deactivation. Now, if you look just initially at the behavior and look at errors uh, in the contralateral field post Musimol injection uh, in VPA, there's the animals are making. Uh, substantially more errors in the contralateral field. So that, that has a behavioral effect. The animal has difficulty finding the target object. Uh, but now for us, the, the mechanistically, the more interesting, more relevant question, I guess, is then what's the effect on the cells in the frontal eye fields? So in the same sessions, but before the Musimol injection, uh, in the frontal eye fields, if you look at these responses that are modulated by space, you see the responses modulated by the spatial attention and whether the, the stimulus is the target or not, the feature attention, you see these signals before the deactivation. But then after you deactivate VPA, what you lose is the fe feature-based modulation of responses and you're only left with the spatial modulation of responses. And there's, it, the cells only care about whether you're going to make an eye movement to the stimulus or not. They don't, in a sense, know anymore whether the object in the receptive field is the thing that you're looking for. Um, so again, it's consistent with this idea that the VPA would be the source of that um, signal about where the target object is. So we're now thinking that the, uh, the, the VPA or the, maybe the IFJ in humans uh, is setting up the target search template in terms of objects and object features uh, and that um, they are the ones computing the, um, the spatial location of the object with those target features. That information is being sent to the frontal eye fields and then the frontal eye fields would then be modulating activity back in posterior cortex according to the target identity. Uh, but for just spatially based attention, of course, the frontal eye fields would be dominant in, in modulating activity back there as well. So it's an interactive system for both spatial and feature attention. And just to acknowledge the, the people who 
did those experiments. All of the, the work in VPA and monkeys has been done by uh, Narcisse Bichot, uh, and the feature ba the, all of the MEG work that I described has been done by ba Daniel Baldoff, who's now actually here in Italy uh, running the MEG Center in uh, Trento. Uh, thank you very much.